This video is brought to you by NVIDIA's RTX GPUs, powering technological leaps like the new overdrive ray tracing mode in Cyberpunk 2077. I got early access to this build and I've been playing around with it. It is astounding. I cannot believe how transformative it is. And I'm going to show it to you in some more detail at the end of the video. Gamers, it's a me, Shill Up. Hope you had a fantastic Easter break if you celebrate Easter or just some time off if you live in a country that does celebrate Easter or just a good weekend in general. I did take some time to chill out, spend some time with family, overdose on chocolate, and I saw the Mario movie. Believe me, we'll be talking more about that later in the show. Outside of that, we did the Friends Per Second podcast last week featuring none other than Alana Pierce, where we spoke about the death of E3, and Susie, aka the Sphere Hunter, joined us for a deep dive into Resident Evil 4 Remake. That was a great chat. This week on the podcast, we're actually going to have Jason Schreier, a man who's reporting, I often quote on this very show, we'll be talking to him about how he breaks news, the state of games media, and what it means to be a games journalist in 2023. It's going to be an interesting chat. That'll be up on the channel and on podcast platforms this weekend. I am looking forward to it. So like every other week, there's also been some gaming news headlined by the reports of a new handheld from Sony. Though believe me, you probably don't want to get your hopes up about this one. All right, let's take it from the top. Sony are no strangers to the handheld business. Their first handheld, the PSP, was a technological powerhouse at the time, promising to do what Nintendo don't, with cutting edge graphics, a beautiful screen, SD card support, and the UMD format allowing you to watch movies on your handheld, a precursor to the Netflix on your phone experience we all enjoy today. Sony would follow up on the success of the PSP with the release of the PS Vita, a handheld that was by all accounts a commercial flop, as Nintendo's stranglehold on the handheld market was absolute with the DS and 3 3DS. Still, many people hold a candle for the PS Vita to this day thanks to its excellent OLED screen and its library of exclusives, many of which were Japanese RPGs that still have not yet been ported to other platforms. After this, Sony was reluctant to re-enter the handheld space, especially after the release of the Nintendo Switch in 2017, a handheld so absurdly successful that it is still the best-selling console even today, six years after its initial release. Despite this, PlayStation fans remain hungry to see Sony pick up where the Vita left off, with calls for a handheld intensive after the release of the Steam Deck, Valve's first successful foray into dedicated PC hardware because the Steam machines absolutely do not count. But if recent reports are to be believed, Sony may be ready to dip its toe back into the handheld waters, but in a way that's probably going to bum out everyone but dads who get kicked off the TV so their kids can watch Frozen for the 98,000th time. This report, which is unconfirmed at this point, comes from Insider Gaming, and they are willing to go on the record to reveal the existence of a new PlayStation handheld currently codenamed Project Q Lite. What are the specs? Will it support 4K ray tracing? How fast is the memory? Can it run Crisis? All of these questions and more do not apply to this hardware because if this reporting is accurate, this is actually a streaming device that will work exclusively with remote play for the PS5. That means you cannot install games on it, you cannot play games from cloud streaming services like xCloud, GeForce Now or even PS Plus, and you cannot use it anywhere outside of your house since you will need to be on the same wireless network as your PS5. Also, your PS5 can't be in use by anyone else since you're essentially using the PS5 with the image being beamed to this handheld device. Inside Gaming do say that the device will support 1080p resolution and 60fps, and that the current prototype looks like a PS5 controller with a massive 8-inch LCD screen at the center of it. It will also apparently support adaptive triggers and haptic feedback. As for the release timing, the window is unknown, though it is expected to be before the release of the PS5 Pro, which rumors are putting at a holiday 24 release, meaning that if this handheld is real, we should expect it sometime early to mid next year. So what do we think about this? Uh, I think this is weird. At a very basic level, the functionality that powers this device, Remote Play, exists specifically to allow you to play on almost any device you damn please. If you have a phone or a tablet or a PC, you can Remote Play your PS5 right now. Sony even made a flashy trailer showing that you can do that. Hell, they partnered with Backbone to release a dedicated PlayStation controller for iPhone, and now they're making a handheld and its only job is to do something that a bunch of other devices can already do? It's somehow an even less appealing proposal than Logitech's recently released G Cloud console, a console that also specializes in remote play, but it can also be used to play on cloud streaming services. Still, if you peruse the reviews for that one, you hear the same thing from basically every review. It's okay, but other devices do the job well enough, 
and a Switch or a Steam Deck is a vastly better investment considering that the G Cloud was roughly the same price as those alternatives. Which brings us to the question of cost. I mean, full haptics and adaptive triggers, 1080p screen, 60 hertz, the PlayStation brand, you're gonna tell me this thing is gonna retail for 100 bucks? Please, if this exists at all, I'd be stunned if it retailed for any less than $299, at which point you may as well cop the extra 100 and grab a Steam Deck, or maybe even spend a little more and grab that recently announced Asus ROG Ally if that ends up being any good. Hell, the Nintendo Switch successor is rumored to be releasing sometime next year. If you already have a PS5 and a phone, you can use that and spend the cash on Nintendo's next big thing instead. So I don't know, man, my gut on this rumor is that I just can't believe it's true. I can't see this product category really making sense for Sony. I think there's a genuine opening for them in the dedicated handheld market that would absolutely be a risky play. But do I see them putting out a dedicated remote play handheld? I don't know, man, I'd be very surprised personally. Jeff Grubb of Giant Bomb has stated multiple times that we should expect a huge Sony showcase before the Summer Games Fest kicks off in June. That will be where Sony unveils the next phase of the PS5's life cycle, apparently. So if we're going to hear about this device at all, it's probably going to be then. I will, of course, keep you up to date because few thumbnails are more clickable than those picturing fake console mockups. It's just free views. I don't make the rules. Pivoting from Team Blue to Team Green, this week marks the departure of one of Microsoft's most lauded hires. Joe Staten is an industry luminary, a key architect of Halo back in the day who would later go on to lay a lot of the creative groundwork for Destiny. He joined Microsoft a few years back as part of their publishing team and would later go on to join 343 as one of the senior leaders in charge of Halo Infinite. That did not go well, but that certainly wasn't any one person's fault. The culture and management issues of 343 have been well documented at this point, with no single figure emerging as the bottleneck to success. Joe would leave 343 after the launch of Infinite to return to Xbox Publishing, but IGN caught wind of his departure this week and Joe confirmed it on Twitter, saying that he would have more to share on the matter soon. Generally, when people say this, it's because they're starting up their own studio, and with Joe's talent and CV, it's difficult to imagine he'd struggle to get funding for his own thing. Still, this is absolutely just speculation on my part, and we'll get official word from Joe soon. Sticking with Xbox, their first big exclusive in a hot minute is struggling in the hype department. Redfall from Arcane seems to be their take on Far Cry or Borderlands, complete with co-op shooting and a lengthy loot grind, very different from anything that Arcane's done before, and that's either a good or a bad thing depending on who you ask. Previews for the game hit a little while ago, and were a little mixed. Some outlets optimistic about the title, while others were a little more tepid in their coverage. IGN is profiling the game at the moment as part of their IGN First series, where they get exclusive access to the game ahead of release. They uploaded some captured footage to their YouTube channel, and yikes, that is the only conclusion you can reach when you look at this like ratio. 1.5k up to 19k down. YouTube tries to hide the dislikes, but we can still find them. Backlash can be attributed to two things. The first is the person playing the game. And yeah, they're not great. I actually do feel a lot of sympathy for previewers though, because you often have to play with a controller and as a keyboard and mouse main, I hate that. And I feel like my footage would probably look like this if I had to play on a controller. But secondly, you're often dropped much further into the game and you don't really know what you're doing and you don't know button mappings and you're kind of just overwhelmed by what's going on. So personally, I'm cutting IGN a break when it comes to this gameplay. My issue is the actual game because like, this does not look good. This bullet sponge boss dude who doesn't do anything other than just run at you and all the abilities seem to not do anything and these random NPCs who kind of just stand there and I'm like, I don't know, man, that, that was the issue for me. I've seen other clips which are certainly more encouraging than this one, but if this is the best footage that IGN managed to capture during their hands-on session, then yeah, that's a little worrying. Thankfully, Redfall is coming to Game Pass, making it easy to try out and also easy to play with friends. I feel as though that Game Pass thing is gonna help a lot because I know many people still have a lot of questions about this one, myself included. Hey, did you guys hear about this Monster Energy shit? Okay, so while Monster are more than happy to appear in video games like Monster Energy Supercross Garbage 2 out of 10 Trash Fire Champion Edition, as well as Death Stranding, one of the greatest games ever made, they apparently don't like the word monster appearing in other video games. We first heard about this back when Ubisoft had planned to name their Greek mythology themed game Gods and Monsters, but a legal challenge from Monster Energy forced a change to Immortal Phoenix Rising, still one of the worst names for any non-mobile game ever. Well, Monster are back at it. Last week, an indie developer called Glowstick Entertainment revealed that they were being served a legal notice by Monster over their game's name, which is Dark Deception Monsters and Mortals. In the past, Monster have argued this could lead to confusion and that poor innocent shoppers may end up accidentally purchasing an indie game instead of an energy drink. 
Thankfully, the developer called Monster out publicly and has vowed to fight them in court. When this news broke, it was also revealed that Monster had filed complaints with the Japanese trademark board against the Monster Hunter series, which actually predates the invention of Monster Energy, mind you, as well as Pokemon, the most profitable IP in the history of IP. God damn, I hope they try to take Game Freak and Nintendo to court. It would be so hilarious to see Nintendo's lawyers absolutely ream these shameless trademark trolls. It would be the one and only time we'd be cheering for Nintendo's lawyers, and then we'd all go back to endlessly complaining about them the way we're currently complaining about Monster Energy. Speaking of scammers, let's say we check back in on that Ark story from last week. You know, the one where they tried to charge for a remaster after promising it would be free, charging for remastered DLC, and turning off the old service to force you to upgrade? Well, the developer tried to justify a lot of that by the fact that the remaster would include a copy of Ark 2 when that eventually arrives, if it ever arrives, because this studio does not have a good track record with the whole delivering on their promises thing. Case in point, they've heard the feedback and they're removing Ark 2 from the remaster and now instead of charging $50 for the remaster, they're charging $60. And it will now include some of the DLC. And they're still turning off the legacy service. So yeah, clearly a uh, problem solved, I guess. Uh, raise the price and take away the good part of it. That, uh, that sounds like a great solution. Let me know how that goes, guys. Sticking with the theme of disappointing news, Capcom have released the Mercenaries mode for Resident Evil 4 Remake. By all accounts, it's just as excellent as the main game and people love it. Still, there's very little celebration going on because along with this update came a boatload of micro transactions. The weapon upgrade tickets sell for a couple of bucks and let you upgrade your weapon faster. Okay, that's super dumb. And how much money are you really going to make from that? Is it worth sullying the reputation of arguably the greatest remake ever and arguably the greatest survival horror of all time? I don't think so, but companies keep doing this shit, so I don't know, maybe I'm just naive. What do we finish on some good news? This week, footage of a Persona 3 Golden remake and Jet Set Radio remake appeared online. I've seen them, they are very, very legit and clearly indicate that we should expect these remakes at some point. The Jet Set Radio one was actually teased by Sega a while back as part of their Super Game initiative, but the Persona 3 remake was a total surprise, though one that makes a lot of sense since fans have been clamoring for it for a while now. This footage was apparently part of an internal pitch deck at Sega, but given how polished footage looks, there's every reason to suspect that these projects are real and on the way at some point, which is pretty rad. Cannot wait for a new generation to experience for themselves the iconic Jet Set Radio OST, including the line, Yes, I'm cooking for my son and his wife. It's his 30th birthday. If you know, you know. Quick lightning round to finish off, the Australian government is finally doing something about loot boxes, like six years after everyone realized they were a problem. The new guidelines will apply an R18 rating to any game with simulated gambling, like slots, poker machines, or actual poker, while any game with a paid loot box will immediately get an M15 plus rating. This is a big deal since it means that the G rating applied to most sports games will be replaced, and that kids will not be able to buy the likes of FIFA or Madden on their own. Let's be real, who's buying Madden in Australia, right? Basically nobody, but certainly not 10 year olds. Diablo 3's next season will be its final content update, after which time the game will cycle through previous seasonal content. This caps off a very impressive 11 years of support since the game launched in a horrendous state back in 2012, basically necromancy back to life quite literally by the removal of the Real Money Auction House and the Reaper of Souls update. Diablo 3 would go on to become a compelling ARPG entry, but one that never seemed to win the affection of Diablo fans the way that 1 and 2 did. Hopefully 4 finds better success. Speaking of which, Diablo 4's launch times have been confirmed. Deluxe and Ultimate Edition owners will be able to play the game 5 days early, commencing 4pm PST on the 1st of June, while everybody else will have to wait until June 6th. The upgraded editions will give you a whole bunch of unnecessary bullshit, including the paid battle pass, which is going to be a feature of Diablo from now on, so get ready for that one. If you're wondering if The Last of Us on PC is still broken, yep, it sure is. Naughty Dog have issued a statement being like, guys, we're working on it, we're really sorry, etc, etc. But it would have been pretty cool if that work went in before they released the game rather than after. The one immediate byproduct of this is that the promised Steam Deck support now seems like a distant dream, as Naughty Dog have confirmed that Steam Deck verification is now very low on their list of priorities. Is this a strategy to get us playing on Sony's secret new remote handheld instead? If deck support doesn't arrive before the new handheld does, I'm going to say yes. Esports and content creator organization FaZe Clan went public a while ago with a valuation in the billions. Not sure why, I think Wall Street was just snorting too much G Fuel that day. That valuation has unsurprisingly collapsed, with FaZe Clan now trading at 50 cents a share compared to its historic high of $20 a share, resulting in the Nasdaq issuing an official warning that they will be delisted from the exchange if they can't bump that price up to $1 a share. Worse. Snoop Dogg has left FaZe Clan's board of directors. You might say he's 
drop them like they're hot. No, I'm not gonna do that. Don't worry though, face hand. I've got just the guy to replace Snoop Dogg. It's the newly fun employed but highly employable Phil Harrison formerly head of Google Stadia, and before that, a head honcho at Microsoft during the nadir of the Xbox One era, and before that, a head honcho at Sony during the nadir of the PS3 era. If there is one person who can be relied upon to take a promising idea and successfully pile drive it into the ground, it is this man. So FaZe Clan, if you want to do something really funny and make a bunch of short sellers really happy in the process, hit him up on LinkedIn ASAP. So what got announced or delayed this week? Well, a little while ago, I profiled Gun Jam, another one of those FPS rhythm games like Metal Hell Singer and BPM. This one is occupying a very different soundscape though. Dirty Euro Trance and Dubstep. And I'm not gonna lie, that is very much my Gun Jam. The team behind this just announced a release date and they are not wasting any time because Gun Jam launches next week on the 19th of April, exclusive to PC and Oculus if you are down for some VR. Square Enix has found a new way to sell us old Final Fantasy games. The new package is called Final Fantasy Pixel Remaster and includes visually upgraded versions of Final Fantasies 1 through 6. The package got a release date announcement this week, April 19th as well, actually, same as Gunja. You can already get these games individually on Steam or discounted via a bundle. When asked if these remasters would eventually arrive on Xbox, Square Enix responded with, Xbox? What's that? Never heard of it. And then they rode off on a choker by, I couldn't believe it. Here's a cool announcement. Forgive Me Father is getting a sequel. The first game was a brilliant retro inspired shooter with a truly arresting art style blending eldritch horror with comic book framing and color palettes. Reviewed extremely well, 92% very positive on Steam. Great response from the critics. Even with all these accolades, sequels in the world of indie games are rare. So it was nice to see the team roll out a reveal trailer for Forgive Me Father 2. There is no date on this one yet, but given the timing, we certainly shouldn't expect it in 2023. I will keep you posted. Another indie I've been eagerly anticipating is Trepang Squared. Now this is one I played a while back during a Steam Next Fest. Aside from its absolutely superb shooting mechanics, its biggest selling point was its enemy AI, which aimed to recreate the intelligent maneuvering and flanking of the fear games. It was absolutely doing that during my brief time with it. And this one quickly shot up to the top tier of my indie wish list. This one is definitely one to keep an eye on. It's launching exclusively to PC on the 21st of June. Two updates to shout out now. The first is for No Man's Sky, which just this week got yet another one of its characteristically free updates. This one is called Interceptor and it adds a new corrupted material and the ability to take control of new spaceships you might find lying around, plus a cool new jetpack, plus improvements to the PSVR 2 mode, plus heaps of other cool shit. You can read about it all in the patch notes. That is, of course, totally free and available right now to anyone who owns a copy of No Man's Sky. The other update is kind of a big deal. God of War Ragnarok has finally got a New Game Plus mode. The update does all the things you'd expect a New Game Plus to do, like being able to play through from the start with all weapons and skills and armor unlocked. But the update also includes a bunch of new stuff. For starters, there's new armor sets to collect here, new visual options for existing armors, new enchantments, an increase to the level cap, as well as new things called burdens, which are enchantments that actually make the game harder by applying negative status effects to Kratos. There's a lot more stuff than I've listed here. It's quite chunky indeed, and more than enough reason to revisit this absolutely extraordinary conclusion to Kratos' Norse saga. Best of all, there is no waiting because this update is available right now. Finally, two gaming events were announced this week, both of them unsurprising, but it's nice to know they're back. The first is the PC Game Show hosted by PC Gamer. Curiously, there was no mention of Epic Games being the principal partner for this one, which they've been doing for the last few years. So no word yet on if they'll return or if some other brand will pick up the tab. PC Gamer did confirm that Day9 will return as host for the event, which frankly, I'm happy about because that dude always puts a lot into it and I think it lands. What doesn't land is the length of the show, which is typically gone for upwards of two hours or more. Hopefully they rein it in a bit this year, especially since they're promising that it will be an afternoon or evening showcase on June 11th, following the Xbox and Starfield directs whenever they may be. And finally, Jeff Keighley, the final boss of video games, has confirmed that Gamescom opening night live will return on August 22nd. This is an increasingly important beat in the game's calendar as it's the last showcase before the year-end release schedule kicks into gear in September. Jeff didn't provide any specifics, but we can surely expect an hour or so of reveals, trailers, celebrity appearances, and anti-vaping commercials. Jeff is like the Mr. Garrison of video games, except instead of drugs, it's vaping. So what came out last week? Well, funnily enough, the biggest gaming release last week wasn't a video game at all. It was in fact the Mario movie, which went on to have the biggest opening weekend of any video game adaptation ever, $137 million at the box office in that opening window alone. No doubt helped by that Easter break giving people a bit of time off, but also no doubt helped by the fact that it's a pretty great movie. I actually reviewed it on this very channel, link below the like button, and I loved it. I thought it was a brilliant adaptation of the source material full of personality and comedy and great sequences and the music, Mamma Mia. 
A lot of people are dismissing this as safe, and yeah, it is, but I fail to see how that's a bad thing when we're talking about Mario. He's not an edgy, avant-garde, art house cinema candidate. He's a plumber who uses his head to break brick blocks on his way to saving a princess from a giant turtle who wants to marry her. Would Martin Scorsese call this cinema? No, but he's just jealous because he missed out on the chance to play Mario back in 1993, which to be honest was a bad call because Scorsese is actually the perfect height and ethnicity for the role. Either way, the critics don't like this, but everyone else seems to. That's a hell of a spread on Rotten Tomatoes, and I fully expect we will see many more Nintendo films in the future, including hopefully a Luigi's Mansion movie, because Charlie Day as Luigi was absolute chef's kiss. Okay, so what about actual video games? Well, Meet Your Maker dropped last week, available on all platforms bar the Switch, but also available as a PS Plus game. Speaking of Mario, this is sort of like Mario Maker meets Quake, People create these labyrinthine death trap maps full of lethal shit, while other people load up those maps to see if they can get through them. This one has had a bit of a rocky start as people were getting to grips with the core concept, but with some time played, people seem to have adjusted well. The title sits at a very respectable 83% very positive on Steam, while critics have it at a strong 77 on Open Critic. IGN was impressed, scoring it an 8 out of 10 and saying, quote, Meet Your Maker is a great start for a dungeon delving shooter that's as unique as it is hard to put down, end quote. Push Square were a lot more muted, scoring it a 6 out of 10 and saying, quote, Meet Your Maker's core premise is very strong, but the game's aesthetic and samey levels currently don't live up to that vision. While it can be fun in short bursts, raiding outposts can quickly become tedious, although building your own stages for others to try is more fulfilling. Unless Behavior Interactive can deliver much more variety in both gameplay and tools available to players, the game already feels like it's reached its limit." End quote. Curse of the Sea Rats is that cute-looking hand-drawn 2D side-scroller starring Pirate Rats. Sadly, it doesn't seem to be all that great. Steam has this at a mixed 46%, while Open Critic has it at a weak 65. GameSpew scored it a 6 out of 10 saying, quote, Overall, Curse of the Sea Rats is a perfectly playable Metroidvania that feels rough around the edges. Mechanically, it can feel a little unfair at times due to things like stiff animations and unfortunate enemy placements. And while its four protagonist setup is a neat touch, it can be a grind to upgrade skills if you decide to change. Still, fans of the genre are likely to enjoy their time with it, end quote. Raven's Watch is the next thing from the team behind Curse of the Dead Gods. Their latest release dropped last week into early access, and it seems as though it could have done with a little more time in the oven. The game sits at 70% mostly positive, not a great result for such a talented team. If you read through the negative reviews, almost all of them comment that the game itself is great. Awesome combat, class design, visuals, performance. The issue at this point seems to be content, which even though this is clearly advertised as an early access release, still seems to be a little skint in the content department. Seems like a surefire thing when the time comes, but for now, it may be an idea to wait until there's a little more raven meat on that raven bone. And finally, the biggest actual video game release of the week is Everspace 2, a much anticipated follow-up to a space shooter indie darling. This one has been in early access for 18 months and it appears to have paid off because boy are people loving this video game. It's 88% very positive on Steam and a mighty 84 on Open Critic. PC Gamer were all about this, scoring it an 85 and saying, quote, shooting, looting, and RPGing in space has really been this good, end quote. And God is a Geek went even further, scoring it a 9 out of 10 and saying, quote, Everspace 2 presents a whole galaxy to unlock and explore, or the ability to just fly around and cause mischief. Either is great fun, end quote. I'm actually playing through this one myself at the moment, and I'm having a great time with it. I thought it was going to be like Diablo in space, but so far it's more like an open world game in space rather than a true loot up. Still, I'm really digging the visuals, the story, the sense of exploration. I feel like I'm just scratching the surface right now, but I'm very keen to explore more. Not sure if I'll have time for a review of it, but I'd like to do that. Just chalk it up as a maybe and hopefully I'll surprise you one of these days. So what's coming out this week? Well, it is a very quiet week indeed. A nice chance to catch up on your backlog maybe. Still, if you insist on some new hotness, there's a little... First up is Sherlock Holmes The Awakened, which is actually a remake of a title released back in 2007. This is perhaps the most beloved entry in Frogwares narrative-led detective series, hence the desire to punch it up with all new visuals and gameplay mechanics. This one arrives on all platforms today. Tron Identity, bet you forgot about this one. This is not an action game or even an FX-style racing game, though I'd certainly kill for one of those set in the Tron universe. No, this is actually a narrative adventure game from Bithel Games, the people behind the Solitaire Conspiracy and Thomas Was Alone. Absolutely no one expected this team to be the ones to take on a Tron game, and absolutely no one expected a Tron game to be a talky adventure game. But here we are, and the title launches exclusively on the Switch and the PC today. Ghostwire Tokyo is finally free of its PlayStation shackles and arrives on the Xbox on the 12th, as well as Xbox Storefront for PC, which means that yes, the game will be available on Game Pass for both PC and console. This is from Tango Works, the team behind The Evil Within and Hi-Fi Rush. To be honest, I didn't much like it, and a bunch of other people didn't either. A brilliant premise and setting squandered on some very phoned-in open-world RPG tropes 
probes and some pretty subpar combat to boot. Still, there's definitely some stuff here worth experiencing at that Game Pass price tag. So if you're at all curious, I do recommend downloading it and checking it out for yourself. And finally, the only other release for the week is the Mega Man Battle Network Legacy Collection Volume 2. It's more of the classic Mega Man Battle Network stuff, only this time pulled from the fourth and sixth games, made playable on modern hardware and fully online play enabled. This package does require you to have purchased Volume 1, so watch out for that. It arrives on all platforms by the Xbox on the 14th. And that is the week ahead. I told you it was quiet. But hey, plenty of good stuff to look forward to in the future like this. So uh, put this on your radar. Lately, I've been profiling a whole bunch of PS1 style survival horror games. So I thought I'd mix it up by doing something totally different. A PS2 style survival horror game. Let it never be said that I'm unoriginal. This is Hollow Body. It describes itself as a tech noir survival horror short story set in the urban decay of a long abandoned British city. So like London in five to 10 years, tops. This has a very Blade Runner 2049 opening. And after that, we're thrust into the urban decay and sprawl that plays host to all manner of gangly ghoulish foes who you can shoot or beat to a bloody pulp. This is the second game from Headwear Games, who before this put out the well-received Chasing Static, another psychological horror short story, only that one was set in Wales. Clearly, this is a studio that's sticking with what and where it knows, and I think Hollow Body has a hell of a lot going for it. If you're keen to learn more about it and maybe wishlist it, I profiled it over on my Steam Curator page, which also has links to all of the other put this on your radar stuff I've recently covered. I'll leave a link to all of that below the like button. Sort of free stuff time now, and very little to shout out this week since it's the second week of the month and we did all the big announcements last week. The good news though is that your PS Plus games, your games with gold, and your prime offerings are now available to collect. Big standouts including Meet Your Maker and Sackboy on PS Plus and Wolfenstein New World Order on Prime. Epic is the only new shout this week, but luckily Uncle Tim is serving up the goods. Right now you can still get Dying Light Enhanced Edition, Techland's seminal first person open world zombie game. Snuck in last minute was also Shapes. I hadn't heard of this before, but I watched like two seconds of the trailer and I was immediately hypnotized by it. It's an automation game where the goal is to build shapes. Doesn't sound like much, but trust me, watch the trailer and you too will fall under its spell. Those two are available right now, but in a few days they will disappear replaced by two new titles. The first is Mordhau. While everyone awaited Chivalry 2, Mordhau slipped in and stole more than a little of its thunder. It's an excellent first person medieval battle brawler where the focus is on creative dismemberment. If you haven't played any of these before, you're in for a really good time, trust me. The other title is Second Extinction, a horde shooter featuring dinosaurs. No exosuits though, that's exoprimal. Second Extinction is meant to be pretty good, but not necessarily a must play. If you do plan to pick it up though, it's definitely one you're gonna wanna play with friends rather than solo, it's just that type of game. Feel good story for the week time, and speaking of co-op shenanigans, there are a few games better suited to that than kart races. I certainly have my fair share of memories sitting around with my brothers playing Mario Kart balloon battles. Over the years, there have been many IPs and brands that have tried to recreate the Mario magic. Sega, Nickelodeon, Sony, Star Wars, Final Fantasy, hell, Disney are about to release one next week. But if any developer is gonna steal the kart racing crown from a top Nintendo's head, it's FromSoft or at least an unlicensed fan game based on a FromSoft title. Roll it, Austin. <laughs> we will probably never get Bloodborne on PC, so in the meantime, we can settle for this. Bloodborne Kart Racer. It's the work of a solo developer who goes by the name Lilith Walder. And believe it or not, this is not their first Bloodborne related release. They've already put out a PS1 style demake of Bloodborne, and now they're taking things to the next logical step, a kart racer. This project is fully unlicensed and not at all sanctioned by FromSoft or Bandai Namco, but can I just say how fucking cool it is that they're letting this person do this? Because if this was a kart racer based on a Nintendo property, they'd be suing Lilith down to their last ice cube in their freezer. So good on you Lilith for making it, and good on you Miyazaki for being cool with it. Feel good vibes all around. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the show for the week. You did it, you made it to the end once again. Give yourself a big round of applause. Don't give me a round of applause though, since I can't hear it, that's not how sound works. You know what I can hear though? The sound of you clicking the like button on the video. It's the one sound that YouTubers can hear from any distance. Something to do with frequency or something. I don't know. So do your boy a solid clickety click that thumbs up. And hey, maybe if you're feeling generous, you want to subscribe, ding the bell. Why not go the whole hog, huh? This week is a little quiet on the review front, but I do have one review dropping on Friday night, Australian time. It's a smaller title, but I really like it and I'm excited to talk to you about it. So stay tuned for that one. In the background, I've also been revisiting Night City since this video sponsor, NVIDIA, gave me pre-release access to the new Overdrive ray tracing mode coming to Cyberpunk this week. And I gotta tell you, 
it is incredible. So to be clear, ray tracing has been in Cyberpunk since launch, but even at the game's psycho ray tracing setting, it still wasn't a fully ray traced game. Ray tracing was and is very GPU intensive, and even top end GPUs back then struggled to render Night City in all its shiny reflective glory. That changed with the release of Nvidia's 40 series GPUs. Not only did they deliver a huge uplift in raw processing power, but they also delivered DLSS 3, revolutionary new tech that resulted in the sort of frame rates once thought impossible for titles running at 4K with ray tracing enabled. When I tested that last year, I was getting 130 FPS at 4K psycho ray tracing mode enabled in Cyberpunk. Absolute insanity, and I don't think the game could have looked any better than that. Turns out I was extremely wrong because CD Projekt Red have been working with Nvidia to implement a new ray tracing mode, which they're calling Overdrive. Now, without getting too much into the technicals, Overdrive utilizes what's called full ray tracing or path tracing. Previous versions of ray tracing simulated light from a number of select sources, but full ray tracing simulates light from all sources in a scene. It's the most accurate simulation of light we've ever seen in video games, and its results are truly transformative. On a macro level, full ray tracing makes Night City look more shiny and reflective than it ever has before. Now every single street light, neon sign or internal light will reflect on any surface capable of reflecting it. Night City's roads and vehicles are like mirrors reflecting everything back. And if you just watch the actual road while you're driving, you can see so much of Night City captured in that asphalt. The real game changer though is a lot more subtle and it relates to global illumination. Now light sources will bounce multiple times throughout a scene, resulting in a more realistic rendition of that light as it appears on different surfaces. It also results in more realistic fill. You can see in these comparisons how the psycho ray tracing looks flatter and less realistic than the overdrive mode. That's the full ray traced global illumination, modeling light bouncing and shadow casting in a more realistic way than has ever been possible. It really does look astounding. Every time I step back into Night City, Nvidia finds new ways to make it look even better. And I'll remind you that thanks to DLSS 3, I'm playing this at 4K and I'm getting 100 FPS while doing it, which is absolute madness. This technology is making me so excited to step back into Night City come the Phantom Liberty expansion, which should be out later this year. If you want to experience Cyberpunk and a range of other titles to their fullest potential, then be sure to grab yourself an RTX 40 series GPU. I'll leave a link to Nvidia's website below the like button. Thanks Nvidia for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it.